Hello and welcome to Alternative to Meds podcast. My name is Debbie Nelson and I'm here with Angela Peacock from Medicating Normal. Woo! Hi. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, you know, we met years ago when you came through for the film festival and you were in Medicating Normal and that whole brigade and you continue to be an activist in that arena. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when we met. But it's it's yeah. exciting to see because now you're Angela Peacock Consulting. Um, yeah. So can you share a little bit, Angela? It, thank you so much for joining us first off. Um, but share with us, like how did you venture from being this activist, which you still are, but into doing this consulting or coaching people on medication tapering? Mm. So basically what happened was I had my own series of <laughs> huge amounts of polypharmacy from the mental health system and I had to get myself off of everything. I don't think it was really like in the plan, like long-term, like I'm going to come off of all of my meds and like see what happens. <laughs> but that's kind of just what happened. That's the way that it evolved. And that's when Medicaid Normal found me, the film crew found me and they followed my process like off meds and how hard it was and um, how all the mistakes that I made that were wrong, like a cold turkey that my doctor did at the end. So I, I learned like through my own tapering process, like the correct way to taper and then like the not correct way. And then when I did all the film screenings with Medicaid Normal, like the one we did in Sedona Film Festival with you all, um, I met all these people from all over the world. Like I've had the same experience. This is what happened to me. Oh my God. Like we need more people that understand this and nobody in my family gets it. My doctor's been gaslighting me and all this, like, you know, I just heard patient stories we did about 180 film screenings. So I've heard people all over the world share their experiences with tapering and the medical system and how wrongly they treat it. So at a certain point after doing all those film screenings, I was like, I really need to shift and do something uh, to help these people. I had done a legislative fellowship with VFW and uh, on Capitol Hill. And I tried to like legislate, you know, like try to advocate for us at Capitol Hill. And it was as if I was speaking Spanish, like they did not want to hear what do you mean mental health medicines are hurting people? Like, no, they don't, nobody wants to hear that. So I was like, hmm, I don't, you know, I was, I was looking for an avenue of change. Like, where can I make the most impact? And to me, it was one-on-one -on -one with people suffering from it, help them get through this process. And so that's what I decided to do. So, I mean, we hopped right into it because, you know, everyone, if those of you who have not watched Medicating Normal, it's a musty film. Yes. Um, Angela, Peacock is one of the standout people, and she shared her story and her journey of tapering off of that. And it came from, I've always said, working at Alternative to Meds, when I get a phone call and it's someone that is a veteran, um, Medicaid access client, I already know they have enormous amounts of medications that have been prescribed to them. Yeah. Enormous amounts. Yeah. Um, and the sad thing about that is once they've received those, we all know it's, 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 it's a process of how to even go about getting off of them. And um, people are frightened about it. I mean, we all hear in the news about everything that's going on. And so people hear mental health and they are frightened thinking that people actually need more medications, not realizing that some of these medications are actually causing some of the symptoms that we're seeing in the news. Yeah, absolutely. I have a lot to say about this because especially veterans and people with really good insurance, <laughs> you have the most access to healthcare that you could ever ask for. So when you go to the doctor, that is what they do. They prescribe meds. That is what they do. They don't question like, is this person worsening because they're on five drugs? They don't question like, is that an adverse effect or is that um, their, actually, their actual mental health condition? so to speak, um, there's no like critical thinking. It's just add more, add more, add more. And then the person finds themselves on eight or five or 13. I've seen it all over the, I was on 18 at once. Um, and you know, there's a medication for migraines and now there's one for stomach and now you have pain and it becomes this like complete mess. And if you go to your doctor and say like, I really need to think about a harm reduction approach. Like I want to take less of this. Like, what can I work on? Generally they're like, they see that as like a, a part of your condition. Like what, no, you need these meds. Like you're very symptomatic, you know? So it's kind of like revolutionary thinking to be like, wait, maybe I could do better on less. I think some practitioners are open to that. Um, some are not, especially when people are really symptomatic, but the people I see in general through my coaching practice, it's like, these people are sick because of the meds. 
you know, the physical symptoms like brain zaps and muscle pain, and they just have this toxic feeling and they can't leave their house. Like that's like a neurotoxicity kind of thing. That's not a mental health condition. Like it's not depression. It's phys- very physical because all of their receptors are burned from these drugs. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really I can hard. Accept that. I, I, t- I mean, I took years of Adderall and, um, when I abruptly stopped taking Adderall, I felt like someone had taken my brains and scrambled them. And I didn't quite know how to regain and, and heal because mm-hmm. when you take something like that for years and years, like, what do you do and how do you right. get your brain back to healing? And, and like I, I've tell, we, we've spoken many times and um, everyone always thinks your brain is somehow kind of like, it's like God, it's, it's there, but it's not really attached in any way mm-hmm. okay, it's just there the truth yeah. is our brain is not in like any other organ we have to feed it we have to nourish it we have to do certain things to keep it healthy so mm-hmm. um what are some of the i mean when you got into doing the coaching because you saw this huge need i mean obviously you did medicating normal you had your own personal story i'm sure you had a ton of people that kept contacting you, tons, how, do you do it? how do you do it how do i get off of this yeah. what do i do yeah. And that's what kind of inspired, obviously, Angela Peacock Consulting, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so when you do this, what has been some of your experiences? You know, what are the challenges of helping people get off of these kind of medications when someone comes to you? Oh, I mean, what, the, what are the challenges? The, ch- the challenges are enormous. I mean, I see about six different kinds of people. So it's from the very beginning, like, uh-oh. I think my meds are the problem, but I don't know what to do. And they need help, like getting handheld through the process of tapering and finding a doctor and how to advocate for themselves or how to manage their taper or how to learn about tapering safely. Then there's people that are um, actively tapering. I find that group needs a lot of peer support. They want to be with people that are in the process. They can hear you have this symptom. Okay, I think this is normal. I can do this, you know. And uh, I have lots of tapering support groups. And then I have people in acute withdrawal. They were either cold turkeyed or multiple polypharmacy kind of situation where their doctor ripped them off or um they're off their disclaimer, tape we need to say this yeah, right in the middle of this do not do not do that do not take do yourself not off overnight i say this on every video when we're talking about medications and these types of medications please hear alternative to meds never ever advocates anyone to do this it Me is either. very dangerous never. Never. And anybody who does tell you to do this or advises you to do this, what do you say to them, Angela? <laughs> run, run. You better run. Yeah. You yeah. Don't, so, yeah. Yes. Don't do Anyways, that. Because go that's, ahead. That's, yeah, I was yeah, just like, okay. make sure. No, thank people, you. For people hear that and they go, I want oh, off of these. I'm going to take the. The, and yeah. they don't finish watching the video. So no, what this is, is the, a very long process, please. And is. please find the people like us that know what we're right. talking about. Like, don't. Right. Anyway. Okay. So then the next people. Uh, acute withdrawal, they finish their taper, they're starting the healing process, their brain is drug free. And, and it's, you know, it can be an acute period, maybe six months to two years where it's like really rough, and they just need lots of support and validation. Um, Then there's people that are protracted. So those are people that cold turkey, or they're multiple drugs for multiple years, you know, like a, a more of a complicated case, and they have lingering symptoms two to five years out. I have a support group for them. I do lots of, cause, cause I, th- that was my experience too. My withdrawal and recovery period was very long because of the amount of drugs and the amount of years and the way that I was taken off at the end. And then I have caregivers who, and believe it or not, you know, your loved one is going through withdrawal and injury, whatever you want to call it. And they need support too. They get burned out. They're constantly giving emotional support. Um, and then I have the subset of, of group where, Maybe the child is experiencing psychosis. I see a lot of marijuana psychosis kind of things. Yeah. And, and then they get diagnosed with schizophrenia or psychosis, psychotic disorder. And then they've run through the whole mental health system. Their kids on tons of meds and they don't know what to do. So I try to work with them, like finding other support for psychotic disorders, so, so-called, and um, supporting those parents. And I just, I have a, I have a heart for like people that are ostracized ostracized or oppressed within the mental health system on top of like all that stigma like you're really crazy like you're not just depressed like you have like extreme states that's a whole nother thing I don't view them that way I just have like a loving and compassionate approach with those those family those families so um yeah it's the whole thing like you can be any stage of that process and you maybe tear up I got all like like oh. hearing you say that just because it's so true though you know it's so hard like the doing the jobs that we do we really truly care. 
you know, and we hear Mm -hmm. horror stories. We hear horror stories of families and people that have truly suffered during this. And, you know, it's so networking and and linking arms with people like yourself that are really, truly just trying to help people. I'm just trying to, yeah. And and I find like my, the biggest principle I work by is just love. Like these people just need love. Like this is the hardest thing you will ever do ever. It is like the most excruciatingly painful process. I think on the planet, honestly, to get off meds once, especially once you're, if you're like really symptomatic because the meds have damaged you in some way. Um, And it's like, these poor people, including myself, like you had this earnest need to heal. That's what you were looking for. I'm looking for healing. I want to feel better. And then you're hurt by the very system that is called to treat you. Like, it's just, it's such a betrayal. It's so complicated. Like people lose their identity. They lose their jobs. They lose their livelihood. They lose support from family members. I mean, it is the most, like I say, it's like dropping an atom bomb on your house and all your belief systems about everything that you think you believe about food and water and the, the universe and the meaning of life itself is like challenged through this process. So people need like Sherpas to help them through that, whether it's That's a program true. or right. a, a coach or someone who's walked before it. You know, when I went through it, there was really nobody up ahead saying like, you will rebuild your life. You will get your life back. There was success stories, but so I try to be that for people like, I live in an RV. I travel. I get to see beautiful places, and I'm have human connection again. I can feel my feelings, and I had to work really hard to get where I'm at, you know, and with very little help be from the system. That is the one thing I love following you with your RV life because I've said that frequently with mental health is that we've also overcomplicated our lives, and if your job, if there's different things, you know, it's like, what do we need to do to kind of lessen that load in our, in our brains and our thought process? I realized like I moved to Utah, I moved back to Sedona and I'm like, why did I bring anything back? I don't want anything. It actually makes it so it's difficult for me to function. So, um, but you know, those are, I mean, honestly, those are kind of the challenges that we see frequently that people speak of. Like, you know, if there's the social dynamic, there's whether they have support from their doctors, many people, it's like, how do we help navigate helping them find a doctor that supports them? Exactly. That maybe listens that they don't think that they are schizophrenic, that it is marijuana induced psychosis and what yep. they need to do, you know, yep. Yep. Um, part of it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the hard part of doing what we do, but then we get the good part too. Like oh, yeah. what yeah, are some the of the success part. stories? Share what, share the success <sighs> stories that you've done. I mean, that's, that's why I do this, I think, is because I just find it to be such a um, a sacred thing that I do. I get to witness people heal. Like, I get to witness every single day. I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating. Every single day, I see breakthroughs. Like, oh, my God, Angie, I felt empathy for the first time. I feel love from my husband again. I um, am finding myself again. I, I just went to, uh, I don't know, like a, a yarn shop, and I found a new hobby, and I feel joy again. I'm going shopping. I'm able to drive again. Like these people could not do these things for years. They were, they even just like rethinking their own identities. Like I, I thought of myself as a mentally ill person all these years. And now that I'm like off my meds or getting on less coming down, I'm feeling myself again. Like I'm still in there. I didn't, I lost touch with it for 10 years, you know? So to me, it's just like this sacred witnessing of healing that I get to watch every single day. It's my favorite part and love. I just, I get to watch love like couples. And I'll say, you know, this experience is going to either take you apart or bring you closer together. And it's kind of your, you you know, your choice. And it's going to be very taxing. And I'll see the partners look at each other and say, I think it's already brought us closer together. You know, it's through that great suffering that the great love comes and emerges. And I think is a huge part of healing. Well, that's kind of, I mean, I want to say that with each, person that comes out and stands in front of the camera and you don't have to stand in front of the camera but Angela you standing out in front of a camera and making a very private part of your life very public you shed light on something for millions of people that all of a sudden said this is what's going on with me and that's what medicating normal but I mean when we all of a sudden don't feel alone and we normalize things and um, like I someone once said to me like I don't remember it was a strange interview that I'd done with someone and they said do you mind if we post your full name and I said no no don't post my full name yeah <laughs> I said I don't care if anyone I said because if I can show people that you can get better yeah 
I want to show that, you know, through example, and it's like, it's never done. We're never done with our journey as to what we need to do to get well. No, never it's continuous. <laughs> it continues. It continues. It's not a loss. destination. It's not like it's you journey. lose weight and it's done. No. When, when you when you go through and you're helping people coach, what are some of the strategies? Because you spoke about the different groups, but what are the strategies that you use to be able to help people transition from, you know, I'm on all these meds to less meds, you know, whatever their goal is. What are yeah. your strategies to help them? Well, first we always talk about informed consent. Like I want you to know how difficult this process can be. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a difficult process, but I want to make sure that you know everything that's going on and what, you know, what, 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 what your challenge is here. Then we look at their whole life, the holistic parts of their life. Like how's your diet? How's your human connection? What um, movement can you do right now? We look at the whole system. Then the, I think one of the most important things is identifying why, why are you coming off meds? Why do you want to do this? You have to know that I need to know that. So if things get hard, I can pull on that for you for a resource, but you have to get really clear about like, do I really want to do this? Like, you I know, I, and I hate, I don't even want to say it out loud. Like not everybody comes off meds, but I would say it's not everyone's goal to come off meds. There's people right. in their sixties or seventies that like, they don't have six or seven years to taper and heal from the five drugs that they're on or something, you know? So, and then it's just really like simple, like I said earlier, like love it's reflecting what they're feeling. It's validating how they're feeling. It's validating how hard this process is. It's helping them with little coping mechanisms to try to get through this, um, things that I can pull on that I did in my own recovery or that I see in other clients that are successful. It's, it's a really tough, tough thing. It's really from day to day. I just try to stay in the present moment. I use things like open dialogue uh, principles or gestalt principles. I, I don't do therapy. I don't pull up their trauma and talk about it. Like that's not helpful when you're coming off meds. That's what um, I was going to say. Whenever they address the fears, like how do you yeah, move fears. people that because the fear, um, you know, I, I mean, you know, I was on, I've done placement for clients. I've done all different things, but yeah. I would say the number one fear that we would have is someone even getting help. Yeah. Isn't that sad? Yeah. But truly the biggest fear of someone that has mental health problems is getting help. And that's what do you mean? Like say more, say more. Getting help because what help has looked like to them has been so traumatic, like what you yes. experienced. Yes. That it was not empowering. Nobody no. said to them, Angela, what do you want to do? Nobody ever asked me that. No. Nobody asked you. Everyone talked to you as if you didn't know what you wanted. Yes. Okay. You're too, you were too ill, basically. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, so what help looks like, generally speaking, in our mental health system is scary. Yeah. So not every system is like, you know, alternative meds is empowerment. People come in, it's we're listening to you. It's all that. I'm assuming that's the same with you. Like you're, you're listening and validating people whenever they have these kind of fears. Yeah, I think fear is a huge part of it. it honestly, it's like, I always question myself, like, should you be calling yourself a healing coach or should you call yourself like a suffering coach? Because in general, we're talking about suffering a lot. We're talking about death. We're talking about suicide. We're talking about the, uh, like the human spirit's ability to survive the body's ability to heal. It's like a lot of dark stuff. Like, a, you know, it's not, um, it's actually, it's actually kind of opposite with the, of what the mental health system does. It's not like you're sick, you know, sit in this passive patient role, take your meds, be quiet. It's like, I have to get off of this and untangle this and learn how to live a life outside of the system without a diagnosis and like walk away from all of this. And like, how do I do that? Like, I don't even know who I am. I haven't felt my feelings in 20 years. It's opposite, you know, um, fear is huge. Fear is huge. People are scared. They're going to lose their prescriber. If they tell them I want off these meds, they're going to, you know, take them off too fast. Um, fear of what if I get worse? What if I really am mentally ill? What if I get off my meds and I can't do this? Like it's a day to day fear kind of thing. It's, it's just the nature of the injury. The drugs affect your limbic system right. and affect all your receptors. And chemically you are in fear for a very long time. Many people, not everyone, but many. Yeah, fear. I, you know, they would have, that's a huge, that's a really deep perspective, but truly it's true. Yeah. Because it is meeting people and we are talking about really serious things like suicide and overdoses. And yeah. um, I, I say, unfortunately, in the industry in which we, the pool that we work in, we're working with people that do, they get to a point where they're so despondent, they give up. Yeah. Um, I, I oftentimes wish 
and hope that we can reach those people and help them hear that there is another way and there yes. are people that are getting better yes um we're looking at two people that were very ill and yeah. that got better yes. and you know it doesn't mean our story's done it doesn't mean we don't stop having our own challenges doesn't mean we don't have to do our things like when you go on and you look at um your TikToks that you do mm -hmm. and your facebook's you're in it. I mean, you really are, Angela. Yeah. I, I give that to you. Like you show that you're you're like, I'm at the gym, I'm doing this, I'm out in nature, I'm eating this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're in it trying to show, like by yeah. example. Yeah. You know, well, thank like, you. I never thought of it that I way. Love it. But but no, you made a good point there about hope. Like I meet some people, sometimes they know this, sometimes they don't know this, but in general people patients and I hate using that word but patients in the mental health system because that's what you are that's your role there um they are treated like you know this is a genetic problem this is a chemical imbalance you need to take meds for the rest of your life you'll never get better this is chronic and severe you're disabled they're given all these messages and when you tell them wait and like for me this is what happened your meds could be your problem what do you mean like I thought this was like a lifelong illness that I was going to struggle with and my life was over. And like, what's the point of living a life like this? And it's like, you're giving them another avenue of hope. It gave me an avenue of hope of wait, I could come off some of this med these meds and I could get better and I could get my life back. Wait, I don't have a mental illness like the way that they have told me. So it is like, once you've run out of options and you're at this dead end where you've tried all the meds, you've done ACT, you've done EMDR, EFT, CBT, blah, 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 all the lettered therapies. <laughs> That's what I did. And you run out of, you're like, I'm done. Like, I must be really ill if like none of that stuff worked for me. And now here I am at a dead end. What do I do now? It's like these people find our communities and then they find people that have gotten off meds and got their lives back and they don't live in their patient identity anymore. They don't go to Walgreens and, you know, it's not, I'm not trying to shame anyone. Like I did that for 13 years. I didn't know any better. That's what we are taught. So I do think um, harm reduction approaches to mental health like is a huge avenue of hope for people that have lost all of it through the system. I like that. I like what you're talking about, because honestly, we talk about harm reduction when it comes to addiction, but truthfully, harm reduction when it comes to mental health is truly what we are speaking about yeah. because you should be shaming anyone that you take this medication. No. You shouldn't take medication. Nobody, we, we're not. And we're not there, the, no. No. One of the things I say oftentimes is, it's kind of like saying that antibiotic is bad an antibiotic's not bad. It's just, if we keep taking an antibiotic and we never figure out why we are even taking the antibiotic pretty soon, it doesn't work and it's toxic and it ruins our body. Right. right. I think if we put this class of medications it, with that mentality, like, Hey, let's do a little bit of research. What's, what's the root issue that's causing some right. of these things. And it's complicated right. with mental health. I mean, yes, it, it just, it you know, there's trauma, there's divorces, there's deaths, there's, biological problems and conditions and you know th there's yep. lots so yeah. but the beautiful thing is that there's this exposure that's happening and um alternative demands has really made it their point to link up with other activists like yourself to help people know that there's options because there are there's all different options i always tell people um, just act on what feels right for you so when exactly. you see this video if you go angela is someone that I truly connect with. And I think I would like to work with her. There'll be links below that you could work with her. Yeah. Um, so when we, when you get, when you get somebody and they pop into doing this with you, what are some of the precautions that you have to tell them? Or what are some of the precautions? I know, I mean, these meds are scary. Yeah. I, I think, you know, most people don't realize like, you know, I, I'm sure you feel this way that if someone said I'm on heroin, you'd be like heroin. Okay. Yeah. It's still like, we're not negating heroin is extremely no. serious, but yeah. what we mean by that is these medications are very targeted and they're complicated to get off. Yeah. So what are some of the precautions that you tell people? I mean, I always tell people right away, like go read the FDA pamphlet for your drug. So all you have to do is Google FDA insert and the drug name, read the whole thing. We should have done that years ago, but here you are. So read every pamphlet for the drugs. Secondly, probably don't um cold turkey ever like unless your life is online like it's like a serious like serotonin syndrome situation or something and you're under medical supervision that kind of thing um then i would say you need to read and research and read up on safe tapering strategies 
there's really good um, resources out there like Benzo Buddies. There's Inner Compass Initiative and the Withdrawal Project. There is Surviving Antidepressants. There's tons of Facebook groups. Um, go out there and read. And sometimes it's hard to discern the information that you're reading to see like what is actually pertinent to me. It's it's almost like like you have to learn a whole new language of like how the lay person community has figured out how to get off meds, how people like me have gotten off meds. What did I do? What were the strategies that I did? What works for one might not work for another. So you have a lot of research to do. And then I would say you have to get your life in order a little bit. Like this is not an overnight process. This is long, sometimes multi-year process between and tapering and healing uh you need to look at your diet you need to look at your emotional support in your community you need to look at like what are the coping skills that i'm going to need to use to get through this process in a way i i feel like because we were put on meds and so many of them that you have to go back and do the stuff that you should have done before you were put on meds like the things that we all said that that doesn't work breathing doesn't work for me you know yeah. guided meditation doesn't work for me and it might not work in withdrawal it might work one percent it might work just to pass the time while your body is healing but like you have to get some of these practices in line before you start this process you know then there's ways to talk to your provider i always say um don't tell them what you read on the internet because they don't want to hear what you googled ask them <laughs> Yeah. What do you know about benzo withdrawal? What do you know about antidepressant withdrawal? Whatever drug you're on and just shut up and let them answer. And what their answer is, is going to tell you everything. If you call Alternative to Med Center and say, what do you guys know about antidepressant withdrawal? And they tell you it could take six months. It could take a year. It could take you two years. Our program does this. This is what we have to offer. Um, if they say you can get off overnight or you can skip a dose and you'll be off in two weeks and there's no such thing as withdrawal, you better run because it's a thing. It's in the literature. It's research. It's evidence based, which they claim to be just it's it's there. OK, it's a thing. There's thousands of us doing this right now. Um, so those are the main things. And then I would say, you know, there's a careful way to talk to your provider or your therapist. I've consulted with lots of therapists for people, their doctors. Some of them are open to it and some of them are not. Um, so you just want to have like a full support system. You want to look at your life holistically. You want to have things in place. This is a process. And, and again, you might not have that goal. Like I want to be off all my meds in right. two years, you know, you can have a long-term goal, but like, it's really, you know, what am I going to do this month? What am I going to do this week? You know, you you have to break it down into small chunks or it's, it's very overwhelming to think I have to taper for two years or, you know, I'm going to be healing for a couple and, oh my goodness, how do I do that? So that's kind of you're going you're to be you're going to be healing for the rest of your life. That's what I always say, because it really doesn't matter. Like our challenges as we get older, our hormone changes, this happens, that happens, life happens. And we're constantly in. And, and, and that's a good thing, because now all of a sudden when you have different tools, mm -hmm. I think that's the big thing is that we're, yeah. we're about trying to hand people saying you can. It's yeah, just, you can do it. I think it's just like, don't like when you said it's a lifelong thing. I think it's more like your health is going to it's be a lifelong. priority from now on. Yeah. Right. Your health is life. You don't, you can't just eat whatever you want and, and right. watch garbage news and like, think you're going to live a good, happy life inside your house. No, you have to find a new way to live and be in the world without thinking there's a magic pill out there to heal you. Cause it just doesn't work like that for many of us, you know? Well, it doesn't. And I mean, like you said, we still, it's like, I'll go into that slump of something of whatever I have going on and you'll be mm -hmm. like, all right, what am I going to do? What am yeah. I doing? I'm going to yeah. journal. What am I going to do? Okay. Yeah. Did I eat right? Did I, am yeah. I going to bed? I'm going to cry. I, I'm going to call a I, friend. You know, right. Am whatever. I turning off my cell phone at night? Am I not watching my news? What am I doing? So these are all habits that you're, you're bringing on when, right. when someone, what's your advice whenever someone's wanting to like, they're, they're teetering whether or not to do this. What I would say, if you don't know what to do, you need to wait. Like you can read and research, read some success stories, read about the process, but you know, I don't even, it took me 10 years to get off of everything and get away from the system, like literally 10 years. So, and then another, you know, a couple years of healing. So, you know, people were telling me like, Hey, that's a lot of meds, you know, they'd plant a seed here and there. And I'd be like, eh, but I need this, you know? So I think everyone has their own evolution to, to when they're ready. And I like, I'm really big on this. Like I am not here to coerce anyone. Like people find me, I'm not here to seek you out and tell you that your meds are bad or some, whatever. I'm not like that. People come to this conclusion on their own through a series of good or bad experiences, you know? So I feel like it's just a process, you know, and you, you'll do it when you're ready or not. It's kind of your choice. So what do you envision the future of this industry? I call it an industry, but the psychiatric medication world 
mental health, what, what would you say you feel the future, what we're headed towards? Whew. I mean, it's depressing, honestly, if you, to me, I, I don't, I try to work myself out of a job, but I am currently overwhelmed. Like this problem is worse and worse. It gets, I mean, I never thought three years ago that I would have a full practice with people all over the world. Like it is a worldwide thing and like it affects the whole family, you know? Um, so I see lots of coaches popping up. I see lots of, um, uh, practices of psychiatrists that are learning about deep prescribing, mostly from our communities because they haven't taken meds themselves. Um, so we have a couple, you know, providers that we work with. There's you I think you're the only center that actually does like an inpatient sort of thing. Um, there's lots of programs around that are popping up. There's one in Canada. There's, I think there's going to be more and more. So I would just say like, again, have discernment, look at the coach, look at their qualifications, look at their life experience, look at how they're living. Like, do you want to live like them? That could be somebody that you want to, um, that you want to talk to and collaborate with or whatever for coaching, uh, doctors, just, just be careful. Like some are really, really expensive and it's out of reach for most clients. Um, and then there's online communities that most people are doing this for free on their own. They try to talk to their provider. The provider may or may not understand they, they're able to use their insurance and they just do their best to do a slow patient led symptom based taper on their own terms. That is the most important thing. You have to do it on your own terms. Yeah. I think that's, I, I, whenever someone says, well, they say two weeks or they've alternate, like I'm on one day, one day I'm off, I'm off two weeks on those are, that's, when, that's those when people run into trouble. Really? Yeah. I was just going to say, those are some of the most um, ill people that alternative yes. meds people will get are right. the people who have received that kind of advice. So yeah. um, again, you have to work with your provider that you mm -hmm. uh, trust and like. Um, we're trying to give options, link arms with um, very educated people in this mm -hmm. industry, um, psychiatrists to coaches to everything, and it's yeah. a personal decision. So yeah. our vision is the future of psychiatry is turning into this, we're going to get to the root issues, we're going to get back to the basics. Yeah. As a society, how we treat um, health, and I, mental health is no different than our physical health. Right. So, um, I applaud everything that you've accomplished angela i mean you've you, done so much and i mean you, the first time meeting you and then seeing angela peacock consulting and a coaching platform and hundreds of people getting help thousands of people have reached out to this woman and she i can't tell you how many people that you've reached out to and out of the kindness of your heart, really just trying to help people. To help them, yeah. Really, yeah. honestly, have just tried helping individuals. Yeah. So um, for coaching services, there'll be a link below. Thank you for joining us. Um, we, like I said, we like being able to put various people, different, there's all different price points, different coaches that are doing different things. So if this connects with you, you consult with your doctor and work with Angela. Angela's I'm here for you. I'm here. Really? And the link below will be for Medicating Normal. Um, it's an amazing, everyone should watch that movie because um, well, Angela's in it, but you're gonna be able to get the feel for exactly this movement that's happening throughout the country. Most people um, that are in these communities have watched it, but you know, there's tremendous work that's being done of activism by individuals like you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you. We appreciate Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so you. much for taking the time and the Thank links you. will be below for um, Angela Peacock's services. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. For information about Alternative to Med Center, give us a call at 888 984 9667.